Sal could feel his eyes dragging closed. He supposed there was nothing he could do now but sleep. Hopefully Eddie found his message, but every so often he found himself awake again from the shifts and sways of the plane's turbulence. The next thing he knew, Sal's head was banging and ringing like a church bell on Sunday. The echoes in his mind repeating over and over again. He managed to slide out of his seat, his vision blinking in and out as he stumbles to the back of the plane. He had seen through those slatted black blinks the rat stewardess with an axe driven in her back. Maybe his partner had done this. Is it possible Eddie did that to her? He must have got the message in the bathroom. Sal stumbled into the back of the plane, continuing to gather anything he could get his grimy, greasy hands on. He figured he didn't know where they crashed, but he could fence anything for some cash. Turning back, his vision was a little more controlled. He saw another man. He must have stepped over him. They passed each other, close. Sal tried to see if he was the air marshal, if that badge blinked a bright light on his belt. But it was still too clunky for him to see vision chopping and falling side to side. He approached the stewardess, seeing her hand move. He picked the axe up and swung down on her one more time to make sure the job was done. Falling out the front of the plane, he saw the scattered luggage. The thought hit his mind like a freight train. The drugs, the suitcase with the drugs, where was it? He started to furiously smash open cases looking for it, but to no avail. He heard the man trundle out behind him, followed by the breaking open of suitcases. Was this man the air marshal? Was he looking for the evidence as well? How could he know already? Sal was struck with fear. He needed to find it first. Oh, mate, there's a boat out here. You reckon we can use it to get out of here? Was this man daft? Sal thought to himself. It's a wrecked dinghy. Yeah, that ain't gonna do us any good. That's a shipwreck, and there's not a single island in sight. But what about this radio? Maybe we can use that, mate. Or he wondered if this man was trying to fish information out of him. That's a short range. Another no one coming for us on that. But if I find one in a suity, I could keep in touch with you if you get far away. Radio did prove an authentic thought in his head. That this man maybe wasn't the air marshal. It was either that, or he had already suspected Sal and was an excellent actor. The tip scales of chance made him wonder which it could be. Either he was completely safe, or his future was in jeopardy. He made a choice to keep a much closer eye on this man than to head out on his own. As the old saying travels, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. In this case, he didn't know which one the man was, but staying near him would be the best option. When you ever feel like something's watching you, like, I just got this feeling like eyes are just crawling all over me. We were just in a bloody plane crash, mate. You're probably just in shock. Yeah, you're probably right. You reckon we should set up around the plane? We pile up some rock walls around it, get a fire going. Maybe we can stay here until we get rescued. I'm sure they come looking for the plane. This man was right. Sal too had felt like he was being watched. That glaring press of eyes on his back. But looking out into the woods, nothing would stand out. This man's plan to stay near the plane was a solid one. People would find them here, and the plane would be a nice shelter if the rain rolled in. Sal didn't want to be around when the authority arrived, though. But he would cross that bridge when he got there. For now, this man's plan to stay here was the best for survival. Sal spotted a deer, his stomach rumbled, 
If he got his spear out quick enough, he could stick it before it ran. But he watched a spear whiz past his peripheral. The spear throw was impressive. Didn't expect it from this person. The scales tipped back towards the thought that he was the marshal. Enemies closer, he thought in his head, and his grip tightened in his hand. Ah, nice throw. Struck it right in the back. Yeah, thanks. He wondered if his associate had made it out with the product. Had to be here somewhere. It was on the plane. If Eddie had headed out already, Sal needed to find him or the luggages that they had stored them in. The train reached a station in his mind. A slight pause as the cold breeze brushed his burly face. Wherever they had landed, it was quite remote. It didn't look like anyone was coming to save them immediately, or no emergency response team. So maybe softening the search till he could survive was a more self-preserving thought. Or he wondered if this man was trying to fish information out of him. Sal wanted to get a better view of the surrounding area, perhaps constructing a small little shelter out of sticks and leaves near the back of the plane. He could reach the wings, and there he'd be able to see maybe a settlement, a village, somewhere to go, or some sort of direction of where they were. Perhaps he could see some sort of definite sign of which direction Eddie had headed. He needed a few more supplies to finish up the shelter. Would it even hold his weight, he wondered. With the last stick placed in the shelter, it was complete. He was hesitant, but as he jumped on it, it seemingly held him, but bowed under his weight. Having the height advantage was a hopeful thought. From here, he looked around for anything that was helpful, but his mind was caught off guard by a different sight. Little jokes jumped in his head as he held back the spear. He thought about just throwing it at the man. If he was the air marshal, he could take him out right now, but his sensible thoughts talked him down from that ledge. After he did his search for the sights from the plane, he was left with no clues. He didn't think it would be that simple, but it was worth a try, and he knew that being able to get up on here would be helpful in the future in some way. Cutting a few trees down could create a stockpile of supplies for more solid structures, or building bonfires filled with brilliant flames. Either way, Sal didn't know how long they would be here, or what they would need, but what is the root of surviving? More than anything, he needed to blow off some steams, and swinging an axe seemed fitting enough. The chunk and chop with the axe let a small whistle of steam push back out Sal's ears, relieving the stress of the lost stimulant situation. It felt good when the tree finally let go of its last holding finger. It fell to the ground, smashing. He watched the logs crash into the ground, and he felt relief. Finally, the stress and anxiety of everything surrounding the situation let go. He wanted to do it again. This time, as he finished chopping the tree, though, he saw a man sauntering towards him. He was startled by the fact he wore no clothes, his knuckles almost dragging on the ground. Something about him offset his out. It made him feel uneasy. Hey, you stay away from me. Just stay back. Who were these mud-riddled, pale-skinned people? They circled him like an animal, stalking and watching him from a distance. His instincts kicked in, like being in a pub brawl or an outmatched fight. Buddy, get up here on the plane. Jump up my little shelter. Yeah, just get up here right quick, mate. I felt that feeling, that 
feeling of blood rushing around his body, his heart throbbing. Mate, did you see that guy? He's got a stick in his hand or something. Yeah, I saw him, mate. He ran at me when I was getting up here. I don't think these people are that friendly. Well, we gotta try and talk to him, mate. This might be our only way out of here. Alright, good day, mate. We just crashed here in this plane. I was just wondering if you know the way off of here, or if you can contact somebody, if you got a mobile we can use, maybe. Sal didn't know why he wanted to get their help. They were Neanderthals or cavemen. I think there's some sort of tribal people, like natives to this place. Mate, we were flying over Canada when the plane went down. These defo aren't the indigenous people. Well, what the hell are they then? They run on all fours like bloody dogs. Yeah, I, I don't know, mate. I, I'm not sure. Excuse me, excuse me back there. Can you help us, please? Sal wondered what the hell was going on here. How'd he get the hell away from us? He watched them run and swing at the plane. The rage and fury of his prison sentence refilled his restless mind. His life of troubles. He fell back into his old ways, like an old reclining chair. Get the hell out of here, you muddy little prick. Yeah, we said get the bloody hell away from us. All the horrible things that he did as an adolescent returned with its soft leather feeling. The creature with a stick and using its hands like they were savage claws didn't scare Sal. Oi, drop kick, I'm gonna throw this at you if you don't go away. Sal had had guns shoved in his face before this, bar fights on most weekends. This was an adrenaline rush. He really wished he had a pack of cigarettes right now. Watching them run around like animals, fast and on all fours, it made Sal feel slight unease. What was wrong with these people? Not that he cared, but it was just unusual. Sal didn't take shit from anyone. He wasn't starting with these insignificant bush-dwelling, mud-covered creeps. He jumped off the wing and ran at them. We said get the hell out of here, you bastards. He was ready to catch and kill it. This territory felt familiar. He finally found his home in this fresh world. That's right, you better keep running. The difference was using a wooden spear instead of a sharpened shank, but the stabs felt similar. Barred rage released into relentless rage. The stabs not stopping even once the body had stood still. I'm gonna go look for another one. You might, I'm just, I'm just gonna keep working on these walls. Uh, you know, At least the anger yet. Yeah. It was still charging to the beat of his blood-filled heart. He wanted to find that other one. He scanned the terrain from the plane, hoping to catch the running prey. They were no longer the wolves encircling the deer, but the gazelle the lion watched from the savanna. Ade, he's out in the woods in front of the plane. It's running in. The small one returned and attacked his fellow passenger. Sal leapt from the plane, his thirst for blood not yet filled. He joined the fight. He watched the creature club the man with its stick and the game completely unhinged. Stab after stab, Sal wanted nothing more than to make this creature's life as painful as possible before it took its last breath. Rage hadn't fulfilled the contract in his mind and he wanted more. Burn them, it preached. It's alright, mate. It's always hard the first time. You did what you had to do to survive. If we hadn't done it to them, they surely would have had it done it to us. Let's give them a proper off and throw them on the fire. This man had some sort of fighting spirit though. It concerned Sal. He was good enough with a stick to hold his own and combat these threats. There was a chance this man was the air marshal. Maybe Eddie had stripped him. That thought would make sense. Eddie must have thought Sal was done, grabbed the gun and ran. Sal had not yet figured what he thought of this man. Some of his tendencies led him to believe he was the marshal. However, other parts of his reactions and the way he acted more pointed to him just being a nobody. Again, that thought of friends close, enemies closer rolled into his mind. It wouldn't leave. One thought he did have 
was that regardless of who this man was or if he was on his side or not, right now, with the threat of these Neanderthals clutching their way back, building these balls and working together would help them survive. I see the way you're looking after burning them. It's a traditional method of passing to the afterlife of bold warriors. He had made up that. Well, not entirely. He had heard something about the warrior's death burn bullshit on a documentary channel. Or maybe it was history. It was on the, in the background while he played pool. It was easy enough to convince this man, though. Sal was always a bit of a silver-tongued bandit. This man's actions run a play in Sal's head between faking and acting out, pretending not to be the air marshal, and the other puppet dancing to the theme of being insecure and unsure of themselves. He knew by the way he acted that this man didn't want conflict. He didn't want to kill anybody. But it was unusual that he quickly put together a Molotov cocktail and hucked it at them so aimlessly. That idea sparked Sal's imagination. Perhaps wrapping a torch up here could create a bit of light, and if he needed to hit one of those creatures and catch fire, a double win, a two birds with one stone situation. Mate, I don't think we have formally met, but my name's Richard. I just wanted to say hello formally. Name's Sal. Pleasure. All right, Sal. Looks like you and I are gonna be working together for a while here, eh? Yeah, I got you back, as long as you got mine. Bloody hell with me. Sal didn't lie about that. But he had his back as long as Richard had his. Mainly meaning, if he was the air marshal, and he decided to slap some cuffs or ties on Sal's wrists, he would simply cave his heavy head in with the nearest huge stone, or maybe his hand axe. Sal caught himself staring out into the void of darkness, the whispers of it setting and entrancing him felt like wandering out there. Had he gone insane, crazy? He'd done longer stints, less sleep, but without the aid of his specific product, he wasn't sure how much longer he could hold back the maddening murmurs of this murderous Moonlit forest. Boy, mate, I put some of that tea meat on the fire. It's gonna cook up nice and good. You just come grab some as soon as you're ready, alright, mate? Hey, mate, I'll be right there. He wanted to finish up these walls so that those creatures couldn't rush in from the darkness. He could smell the meat cooking and felt the saliva filling his mouth. Boy, mate, the meat's done. Come grab a bit while it's still warm. We don't want to burn it. It's pretty bloody delicious, mate. The tender meat was delicious. It was much better than the plane's food. Hell, prison's food. It wasn't a meal from a steakhouse back home, but the gnawing hunger's grasp let go once the food hit Sal's stomach. At the very least, this man could help provide food for him. Their survival wasn't reliant on each other, but Richard seemingly did have his uses. With the bows and the finish of the play, Sal didn't want to head far from the main fire. Something about it made it feel like these creatures would stay away. Perhaps the thought of them being afraid of the fire felt so historic. In the same dimension of thoughts, Sal had remembered his shelter was at the back of the plane, away from the light, away from the safety of it. He played with the idea of creating a new one just outside the base of the plane, within these stone walls the stranger had decided to build. Something about it felt right. Wandering away from the camp, he wanted to gather a few more stones. He just wanted to make sure that he could keep his little camp safe as possible. He could feel his eyes drying, making the dark forest harder to see. He was tired, and being so far away while being sleepy seemed stupid. He headed back with haste. Sal's eyes had to begin to tire. 
If only he had found the luggage, he could have stayed awake for at least another day. Sleeping during the night didn't seem like the best idea. What if those creatures came back to kill them in their sleep? That's what Sal would do. But his blinks were getting heavier. His arms ached as he walked. Resting for a bit could actually be good. He couldn't let Richard know he was tired, though. If he was the air marshal, he could cuff Sal as soon as he was asleep. Aye, mate. As crazy as it sounds, we should get some sleep. The more nights we stay up, the worse we're gonna be. It's also cold here, up in Canada, so... Thinking we should probably share a hut. Might help us keep some of the body heat. You're right, mate. But no touchy feely, eh? <laughs> we wouldn't have to sleep if we had some stimulants. <laughs> this worked to Sal's benefit. He could tell by his own words spilling out of his mouth without control that he was reaching his breaking point of mental capacity. He'd already been up for three consecutive nights before the plane ride. In fact, the rest on the plane was the only shut-eye he had had in a few days. That including the blackout from the crash. Resting together in the shelter would be good. He didn't care about the cold, but being in the same place as Richard, he'd be able to tell if he was leaving or pulling something sly. He could feel the pull of gravity on his eyelids, the warped thoughts of fear and anger twisted in his mind. He needed to clear it all. He needed to sleep. Thoughts rushed him. He wanted to run. He could go and make a break for it right now. Run in the dark and look for help. But something held him back. He had this feeling that no one was out there. That he'd just be running out into death. And with that, he decided to collect the last few things before returning to Richard's shelter to finally get that shut-eye he surely needed. Hello everyone, thank you for showing up and watching the second part of the forest episode 1, showing us Sal's point of view on this situation. If you enjoyed it, leave the video a like, and if you want to watch more of the forest series as well as other stories, please subscribe and hit the bell icon. And lastly, leave me a comment down below. Is Sal going to be a danger to Richard? Is Sal just paranoid? Thank you all, and I'll see you next time.